move on. So thank you everyone for joining this morning. Todd and Scott, you're both here, correct? Just correct. Yep. excellent. Okay. And we have Jurgen, who is our um, technical assistant today, along with Mark. So uh, thank you both for helping out. My name is Carrie Colin Hitt, and I'm the executive director of the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. And I just want to say thanks again for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where we are. I think we are covering at least five time zones. So I appreciate the early risers, uh, particularly our speakers for getting up this morning. And Todd, I hope your coffee is refreshed and ready to go. Yes. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to ask um, that everyone, uh, everyone should be on mute that is not a panelist, but if for some reason you are not, because we did have a couple, uh, a couple people joined through probably some technical error as participants, just to make sure you're on mute this morning, if you don't mind. Um, we have our two speakers this morning. I'm going to introduce them in just a second. Uh, they will be uh, speaking for approximately 25 minutes interchangeably um, and actually doing a discussion, which we thought would be the best, best way to approach this with some slides. Um, but we're asking that if you have any questions you'd like to pose to our speakers, and we really invite questions um, to put them in the chat. And I will take care of making sure to hear those questions as we move through our conversation uh, this morning and this afternoon. And also just so you're all aware, the session will be recorded and will be made available in a couple days once we get a chance to take a look at the video and sound and make sure it's good quality. So you can look for that. You'll receive that recording via the Eventbrite link uh, and we'll probably also post it on our website when ready. Just a brief bit of information about the consortium. We're a not-for-profit funded by NYSERDA and DUE whose mission is to fund R&D and offshore wind innovation. We have a number of additional members coming from Maine, Massachusetts, and Virginia, and Maryland as funding supporters, as well as a dozen industry participants on our board and serving us as members as well, and providing additional funding. Some big news from the consortium front. Last week, uh, we announced additional 15 research awards, totaling around $8 million. This announcement was made from the Department of Energy uh, after the offshore wind roundtable, which took place at the White House on March 29th. So great news for the consortium and we congratulate our, our award recipients. <clears throat> if you want more information about those awards, you can visit our website under the news section. There's a PDF of all the awards that we've released so far. Uh, the newest ones are mostly contained on the second page of that uh, PDF file. I won't go through those today, but we encourage you to take a look. If you have any questions about them or want some more information about them, you can contact any of us. And that information is available, again, on our website. Also, um, because I may not get a chance to do this at the end of our session this morning, uh, look for some additional webinars early this summer where we will be focusing on some topic matters that were covered in the award announcements and our challenge areas included in our roadmap. But also we hope to have a session, uh, which I'm calling an innovation pitch session, in which some of the innovation that we're funding or uh, related topics are um, really done in a very quick, kind of a quick format where uh, researchers and developers and innovators can share what they're working on with the broader industry. Um, don't have a date for that yet, but we're hoping it will be sometime uh, in June uh, before the summer really gets in full swing. And again, I do want to thank our members and our funders for sponsoring our outreach in this program today, as well as the many projects that we're supporting. So let's switch to the topic uh, at hand today. Um, our webinar this morning is going to focus on the investment tax credit and the DOE loan program. Both have recently been reinvigorated by the administration and many folks in industry as well. Many of our members and some suppliers have approached with us to get a better understanding of these two topics. And so I'm really pleased this morning to have two experts from the law firm of Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati to share their knowledge. Both Scott and Todd are doing this uh, as a, a chance to really expand knowledge in this space, the offshore wind space, and have extensive experience um, in the industry. Scott and Todd co-teach at the Energy Project Development and Finance course as adjunct fac faculty and lecturers at UC Berkeley School of Law. And as I mentioned, they both come from the law firm of Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. And I'll just say a bit more about both of you before I turn it over. Scott is a partner at the law firm, where he's a member of the firm's energy and infrastructure practice, where he focuses on representing leading and emerging companies in solar, wind, energy storage, 
and energy efficiency markets. Scott advises new and established companies and their investors on issues affecting energy, infrastructure, and clean tech industries, including project development, energy regulatory counseling, debt and tax equity project finance, joint ventures, and startup counseling. Having previously supported the design and construction of international oil and gas projects, Scott brings over 20 years of experience working in the energy industry to this practice. So thanks so much for joining us, Scott. And Todd, I'll introduce you as well <clears throat> now. Todd Glass is also a partner at Wilson Sonsini Goodrich and Rosati, where he leads market leading energy development and finance practice focused on the representation of energy companies, project developers, investment banks engaged in competitive new business models, technologies, and financing mechanisms, revolutionizing generated, sold, and consumed in the US power sector. Todd has extensive experience and with the development, purchase, and sale of renewable and thermal generation projects. He served as a lead project counsel in the commercialization, project development, regulatory approvals, and financing of alternative energy projects, technologies, including solar, PV, concentrated solar, wind, energy storage, hydroelectric, biomass, synthetic, renewable, natural gas, and carbon use and sequestration. So great, <laughs> great experience from both of you. I know my experience from with you, Todd, is from the solar market where you've offered a, a lot of advice to many, many companies. Um, and um, I really appreciate you both joining us this morning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys to get us started. Thanks so much. And again, just a reminder to um, our uh, folks this morning, please send in any questions you might have via uh, the chat function and we'll make sure we get those covered. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Carrie, for the for the kind introduction. And uh, it's really it really is an honor. I know I speak for Todd as well. It's an honor to be here um, and uh, speaking to to you know as a part of the consortium today and uh, um, and and seeing the the interest that you have in this topic. Um, so what we're going to do is is to, uh, is really cover two separate topics. One is tax equity. Um, to begin with, and then uh, and then the DOE loan guarantee program, and in both cases, implications um, really for the you know for the for the offshore wind industry, of course, obviously. Uh, the 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 first part of this is going to be you know focused on tax equity, um, really a very high level, uh, really introduction to try to um, I don't know demystify is probably the wrong word because it will never be demystified uh, fully, but uh, even by people who, who spend all of their time doing tax equity, but at least an introduction so that, that, uh, so that folks kind of have a, have a general sense of what, of what it is and, and what, what tax equity financing is um, and why we use it. So, you know, in, in the last couple of years, um, 2019, 2020, we had, you know, 13 or more billion dollars each, each year of tax equity investments into um, renewable energy projects in the United States. The vast majority of that investment, tax equity investment um, was, was going into wind and solar with it being fairly, um, fairly even between the two, uh, the two technologies. Of course, of course, that's the wind is the onshore wind <laughs> version of, uh, uh, you know, of, our, of our industry. Um, those tax equity investments were made by a pool of only you know around 20 unique uh, tax equity investors, um, and in fact, only about a dozen or so of them are regular kind of repeats in in the tax equity space. So it's a really small, um, a small list, short list of uh, of, of, of investors, um, which you know is generally not a good thing. I would you know would say in terms of in terms of getting diversity and competition in that, and yet it is a it is a robust uh, a robust market. Um, the investments are structured in. Um, actually, a, a pretty complicated way. Uh, it's a it's a very it's a it's a type of financing that requires a lot of accounting and tax and legal um, and 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 modeling support. Um, and uh, it's it's you know it 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 uh, it it's uh, and it and it relies on other things that we're going to talk about over the next uh, you know few minutes here. But uh, you know, so why would anyone put themselves through this process? Why why doesn't it's it's effectively a, a subsidy from you know the tax credit is a subsidy from the government? Why why not just um, give um, you know give people developing projects the money directly? Well, um, there's a lot of reasons for that, which um, really go into politics um, and and. Uh, um, but, but the fact is in the United States, going all the way back to the beginning of um, really the wind industry, way before solar was even really happening, 
um, in any kind of real way. Um, the government, US, US um, Congress decided to incentivize renewables really through tax expenditures and, 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 and via the tax code. Um, and so the industry has developed around that. Doesn't mean it has to stay that way. And we, we may get into talking a little bit more about what, what, where things are going or, or might go. But this is the system that we have at the moment. Um, uh, and uh, you know it 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 works quite well. Um, it doesn't involve any direct cash payments from the from the government as it exists today, um, but it does require a significant amount of of, of uh, structuring. Um, so you know, fundamentally, you can't ignore it in the offshore wind industry or any any of the renewables for that matter. Um, and in particular, offshore wind, given that it's a thirty percent tax credit, you, you'll never will never be competitive. Developer will never be competitive without, um, but we'll, by leaving thirty percent of the overall cost. Um, and we'll get into what that means um, on the table. Uh, so, who are tax equity investors? Okay, um, this is one of the things that actually makes the the system quite rigid and difficult to deal with. Um, tax, tax equity investors, first of all, have to be equity owners in the project. They can't be um, debt. They can't um, be, you know, partners. They, you know, they basically have to be tax. They have to be owners um, deemed to be equity owners of the project for tax, you know, IRS purposes. And so a lot of the work that goes into structuring these transactions is around ensuring that the that the investor who wants, who's expecting the tax benefits, um, is actually an, an, an owner. Uh, an owner. Um, the the tax equity investors have to be taxpayer, U.S. taxpayers, and they have to have a tax appetite. Um, what does that mean? It means that they, you know, they they are for-profit companies first of all, and so nonprofits don't count. Um, you know, much, the mush market is kind of off the table in terms of not nonprofits and schools, universities, that kind of thing needs to be uh, basically needs to be um, corporate taxpayers. Um, and they have to have a tax appetite, meaning um, that they have to have tax liability. Now, um, as you probably read in the news and see all the time, there's a huge amount of, uh, of innovative um, tax structuring going on um, through all, with, with all kinds of companies across, across the US economy. Um, and so a lot of companies actually, and there's a lot of other tax benefits out there. So a lot of companies don't have a lot of tax appetite. Some of the biggest, most profitable, profitable, I use in quotes, companies actually have very little tax, pay little, pay little tax in, in the way that we've, we've established things. And therefore, um, if you don't already have a tax liability or you have other ways of, of reducing your tax liability, you're not going to be that interested um, and incentivized to make tax equity investments. Um, so um, the, the kinds of investors that we do see making these investments are usually financial institutions. Um, JP Morgan and Bank of America, for example, um, represented half of the in, um, tax equity market in 2019. And, and as I said, there's about 20 or so others that are, that are relatively active. But that's it. Um, there's a few corporates. Google made um, was one of the first corporates to make tax equity investments in solar back um, a num number of years ago. Um, and there's been there's been a few others um, that that have uh, that have been active in the space. But for the most a few others that are not financial institutions, but for the most part, they're the large, um, you know, kind of bulge bracket um, banks, New York, New York based banks, but um, not exclusively. Um, individuals are generally not able to make these investments either um, because of loopholes that were kind of closed in the in the tax code back in 1986. So, um, so that's kind of the that's kind of the situation that that we're that we're dealing with. Um, what is the benefit? Well, the benefits tax benefits um, include uh, that 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 when ta when a tax equity investor makes an investment, um, what is expecting is tax benefits basically. Um, either a reduction in, um, you know, uh, a, re a reduction in uh, its basis or the tax, its its taxable income, which is a deduction, or an actual tax credit, which is basically a dollar for dollar reduction in the tax that it's required to pay. For offshore wind projects, that can account in total, if you add the two up, for over half of the initial capital cost on an NPV basis for the projects. So not only is the 30%, which is the headline number you see for the ITC, the investment tax credit, as, um, but there's also potentially the ability to finance depreciation. And when you add it all up, you, you're, you're looking at potentially as much as 50% or more 
of the um, of the project. So I'll just really quickly just mention um, depreciation. It's something uh, it, I won't spend a whole lot of time, but there's also incentives from the federal government um, around depreciation. That, that around depreciation, if you if you had an offshore wind project without any particular benefit but um, incentives on this it would it would uh, um, depreciate over probably a 20 year uh, a, a, depending on the equipment and that but a, but a long time frame in other words you take the total capital costs and you'd be able to deduct depreciation over over like a 20 year period um, wind projects um, qualify for five year makers um, and then there's which which basically brings forward your ability to take those tax deductions um, and means the owners of the project, including the tax equity investor, can can use can potentially use those. Um, um, and then, in, on top of that, there is um, a possibility. Um, you know, Congress has repeatedly provided bonus depreciation, sometimes fifty percent, sometimes one hundred percent, sometimes other other percentages. It's been a little bit ad hoc and haphazard over the last decade or more. Um, but it, it is it is an incentive and it's something that currently you can get 100% depreciation, acceler accelerated depreciation on any, um, any all kinds of projects, <laughs> including wind and offshore wind, um, up until up for any project placed into service before 2023. Um, and then after that, there's there's a there's a step down. A lot, some tax equity investors value depreciation and pay effectively pay for it in their financing, and some some don't. Um, I'm going to move from here really on to talk about tax credits because that's really, the, in a way, the, the bigger the bigger incentive and and the thing that folks are often more that, that tax equity investors are are definitely interested in. Um, there are two types of tax credits that are available for offshore wind projects. The first is the investment tax credit, ITC, um, and that is 30% of the capital costs of the project you can claim a tax credit for, that's a dollar for dollar tax credit um, uh, uh, for any project that begins construction before 2026. Um, and we'll get into what begin construction means because that's important here. The, uh, this was this was a new this was just uh, basically a new tax credit specifically for offshore wind, um, which uh, which was part of the COVID stimulus um, tax extenders at the end of last year, um, and show it so it really is showing Congress has a has a has has quite a commitment here to to offshore wind in the United States. The other tax credit is called a production tax credit. Um, it's based on the production and delivery of renewable energy from a qualifying facility, in this case, a wind farm. So an offshore wind farm can also qualify for the production tax credit, but the PTC has been um, basically in the process of being phased out over the last few years. Um, it, it's actually been in the process of being phased out for decades because Congress often only passes it for, a, you know, <laughs> provides a PTC for a couple of years, lets it phase out. It's caused a huge amount of boom and bust cycles for those of you who've been working in wind, know about this over the last decade or longer. Um, but we do, you know. But the the current the current sunset is for um, its sunset in 2022, um, but um, or at the, at, at the end of 2021 this year. So, but any 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 wind project that um, is able to begin construction this year will qualify for the production tax credit. Now, this is either or. You're either going to take the ITC or the PTC. You can't get both. And for offshore wind. Um, the ITC has always been um, been a been a more lucrative, um, uh, you know, incentive, and so we expect um, we 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 e even if the PTC gets extended, um, we, I would we I would expect that the ITC is gonna is gonna make more sense for most uh, most if not all offshore wind projects. Um, so that's really probably what what uh, what what one would focus on here. Um, the reason for that. Um, is um, you know higher capital costs very very large you you know you, you get all of that that um, that tax credit basically on year one you get to use it right away instead of being spread out over ten years um, and uh, and also the the fact that the kind of per you know for each unit of energy produced uh, offshore wind is a bit more expensive and so um, and so the, the ITC actually just usually makes more sense um, financially. 
Um, I mentioned that the this, the important thing just back on this slide was the uh, you know that the projects there's a there's a there's a deadline that the projects have to begin construction before a certain date to 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 avail themselves of either of these tax credits. Um, that that um, that there's a there's a whole set of very complex rules um, that define beginning of construction, and effectively it's a two pronged test. Um, you have to both e you have to either satisfy what's called the physical work test, which involves the commencement of the physical work of a significant nature, or you have to incur at least five percent of the cost of the project. Um, what you think the cost of it's going to be, you may not know it today because the wind project you know might might not be done for many years. But anyway, you you would you, there's a safe harbor that if you incur five percent, then you know you're going to um, be able to. Uh, Basically, um, that, you, that you that you satisfied the begin construction test. So um, you know, there's the the tax equity investors like the safe harbor because it's it is just that a safe harbor. If you if it's a, it's just if you can show that you spent that five percent, then it's then it's a clear bright line. But on the other hand, a lot of in, a lot of uh, developers and sponsors actually prefer the physical construct physical work test. Um, because um, because it, it it can often mean that they don't have to spend as much money up front. Um, so in the case of like uh, you know the IRS has given us for onshore wind projects as an example that physical work of a physical nature begins with the excavation of a foundation or um, the setting of anchor bolts into the ground or the pouring of concrete pads for a foundation. These are some of the things that we, the virus has said, even though, even if it's significantly less than five percent, that those things qualify as physical work. We don't have um, that kind of guidance yet um, from for offshore wind. So, um, you know, this is an area that, uh, that, that that's kind of um, in evolving. The second prong of the of the test is is the continuity test, um, and what that means is after you begin construction, you have to continually construct or make efforts towards construction um, to complete the project and bring it into service. Um, now that also is kind of a vague standard, and it's not it's not really that well defined. And so the IRS has also provided a safe harbor in regards to how you meet that continuity requirement. And the safe harbor is that if you bring the project into service, if you place it into service, com commercial operation, within 10 years of commencing, of commencing construction, you'll be deemed to have satisfied the continuity part requirement. Now, this is a really huge win for the, for the offshore wind industry because the rest of renewables is subject to a four-year requirement, which is just not, was proving not to be realistic um, for the offshore wind industry. So just, it was literally just, um, again, at the end of December, um, where the IRS came out and basically gave this 10-year window um, and, and defined a 10-year window for offshore wind. So that really takes a lot of pressure off some of the, um, some of the delays that we've been seeing in permitting over the last few years um, and, and gives, gives us more time to get that permitting done, get the technology into place, get the financing into place and that sort of stuff. Um, this is. Um, so once you have a tax equity investor and you have a project, how do you actually monetize the, the, the tax benefits with that tax equity investor? Well, I'm not gonna go through this diagram in detail, but um, the way you do it is you set up some kind of tax equity structure. And there are basically three structures that are used in the industry, in, in, in renewables, um, with the partnership flip structure being the most common. Um, this particular diagram shows a project, if you see at the top, there's the three entities. Um, those are all separate. The three boxes on the top are entities. They, you form um, a project company that holds the offshore wind project. You have a tax equity investor who's one equity owner and you have the developer or sponsor who's the other equity owner. And, uh, and they form a partnership. And, uh, and, and I'm not gonna step through all of this, but the, the purpose of this partnership structure is to basically get as much of the tax benefits to the tax equity investor um, and get as much of the cash to the developer over time. And second benefit is to be able to give the tax equity investor a way to exit the project 
um, after, you know, kind of as soon as possible. Once they've got their tax credits, they've met all of the legal requirements. And that usually happens at around five or six years, around six years after the project is placed into service. The tax equity investor has a, has a way to get out, um, get out of the project and, 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 and basically flip it back to the developer. Um, so in, um, to wrap up here, um, tax equity is going to be used um, unless we get something new, which we might talk about, um, but it's going to be used for offshore wind. It, it will need to be used. The, both the IRS and Congress um, are, are, are really, especially in the last few months, we've seen addressing some of the needs and, and unique needs of the offshore wind industry um, to make fin um, tax equity work. Um, one thing that kind of the supply chain uh, should be should be uh, aware of is that um, meeting those construction commencement of construction deadlines that I've that I've discussed is um, is very important to have very clear and what what some might find to be kind of burdensome documentation requirements um, you know binding contracts. Um, uh, you know, um, lots of documentation around um, serial numbers and maybe photos and, and all kinds of stuff. And these, a lot of this is driven by um, the developers will be asking you for it if you're a supplier. Um, but a lot of this is really driven by the tax equity investors because they, in order to make their tax equity investment, they want to see that, that the construction began on the date that it began. And therefore, they're going to want to see that those costs were incurred or significant physical work. Um, began on that date and they they need they can only see that through through documentation and, and binding contracts and that sort of thing so expect that uh another thing is uh that 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 we'll see kind of each year that they're we're getting to the end uh, as we saw as we've seen over the last few years especially um, in solar but also wind is if you're relying if a developer is relying on the safe harbor the five percent safe harbor um, there's often this just maybe it's human nature, but this mad scramble at the very end of a year where there's a deadline. Um, and so um, rather than, you know, what does it mean to incur 5%? That's again, a, a relatively complex tax question. And, um, and you can, you know, like if you buy something um, in December, but it doesn't get delivered for a few months later and you paid for it in December, um, you can actually you can actually say that you deem to have incurred that five percent in, Dece in December before the deadline ended. Um, but you have to have a, have had a reasonable expectation of delivery within three and a half months. Um, all of these things kind of you know turn into other permutations of of uh, analysis. But that's um, um, there are there are ways to kind of run up against a deadline and um, and uh, not not that I'm encouraging that. But uh, you'll you'll you're 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 um, you know, your customers might uh, might might uh, ask you to you know kind of be a part of that and help them make that reasonable you know understanding of that reasonable expectation of delivery. So um, with that, I will um, turn it over to Todd. I don't know if Todd, you Actually, want to talk about Scott, any further. Keep it, keep it on the last slide, and Carrie and I have a few quick questions. Uh, Carrie, let me ask one that will help the one that I think you're going to ask on behalf of the group because I've been seeing the questions coming in. Um, because this is an IRS-driven uh, um, program and a, a tax code problem, um, these investors are subject to, the, to IRS audit, right? And it's very important to understanding in any partnership of this nature what the tax and equity investor wants. Just tell us if you can, Scott, if they get something wrong or if there's not sufficient uh, you know, documentation of the 5% or something like that, what could happen to the tax equity investor? Because it's very important to understand their perspective because these banks do not like to, to, to lose. Well, yeah. And so just before I answer that question, the first thing is that these partnership flips, which is mostly what's used or other tax equity structures are audited. Um, it's, it's, um, they're not all audited, but a lot of them are audited, a, a very high percentage, because there's a lot of money at stake. Um, and, um, and so it's absolutely necessary to structure them, to model them, to go through all of the, jump through all of these hoops to make sure that the, the applicable requirements are met. 
Um, if upon audit um, there is a problem, um, besides the fact that you'll go through many years or the tax equity investor and the developer will go through many, many years of, of, um, you know, of, of audit and, and, uh, and probably litigation. Um, in the end, if the IRS finds um, that there was a problem, uh, the, then there's, then that the tax credit is subject to recapture, um, which means that uh, the, the, tax equity investor and or and or even the sponsor and other and the sponsor usually provides guarantees as well for the tax uh, credit um, all could be on the hook for basically paying the federal government back for you know whatever wh whatever the, the you know the excess tax credit was that, that was received um, if, if it shouldn't have been received so that recapture um, that that re recapture is uh, is, a, is a real real thing that can happen. Great. Carrie, did you want to go next? I had, yeah, I have two two quick ones. And then, Scott, we can turn to you. Um, and you can punt on these if you want to wait. I mean, Todd, we can turn to you. But if you want to wait until the end to answer, that's fine as well. So the first one is, I'll ask them both. Um, the first one is, um, we know, at least to date, a lot, not all, but many of the developers that are in, um, have won leases or are engaged in the offshore wind market in the U.S. are um, comp not you non-US companies. Um, they may have headquarters here, et cetera. Are they able to take care of, take advantage of tax equity in the US? How would that work? Maybe not. You might not want to get into how it would work, but you know, just a binary answer, yes, they can if they, you know, that question. And then um, the second one um, that came through is, is do you do we know yet if some of the early work that goes into offshore wind development would qualify as construction start, such as um, site surveys, seabed surveys, meta ocean work, any anything like that? Do we know yet um, if that would count towards a construction start? Yeah. So um, on the first question, there are um, there are certainly um, kind of foreign headquartered uh, developers out there uh, that are. Um, that are able to take advantage of the tax credit through their U.S. you know U.S. subsidiaries. Um, one of the things, though, is just in general, sponsors do not typically have the tax appetite um, to suck up you know the full tax credit, and that's why they you know partner with tax equity investors. Um, there are issues with foreign. They get quite complicated with um, non-U.S. and tax equity investors, um, and and some of this has changed in in, in recent years as well. Um, you know, with their ability to take advantage of of the tax credits, um, if you know, depending on wh where where their income is and where they're headquartered. Um, but but the bottom line is 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 the you know the 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 the, the uh, overseas overseas based uh, you know, offshore wind uh, developers certainly certainly are we're able to structure things such, such that their projects will will be able to take advantage of, of the credit. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the 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 types of activities that um, um, that meet the physical that meet the physical work test, I think that's something that. Um, that's something that's evolving, and uh, and, and I, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, the, 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 I think there are there's there's some expectations about what tax equity is going to become comfortable with, in that in that regard, but um, but it's something that I think is is just still evolving in in the space, and so, um, you know, since we don't really have um, definitive uh, definitive guidance from 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 the IRS on it, I think um, it's it's something that's really it's going to be somewhat dependent on the tax equity investor and their and their specific analysis and and a lot of the facts and circumstances around um, what specific work was done. Um, so I don't don't have a don't have a clear answer on that. Um, that was a great lawyer-like answer. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> All right. Carrie, Carrie, I would turn it around. It's going to be up to the industry to ask the IRS right. to create right. more certainty because yeah. it's taken basically 20 years for, for the onshore wind industry and solar industry to really get more definition about about that physical work and what counts as 5% and the like. And we've gained it over time, or, or some of it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I have one more question and then we'll flip over to the, uh, the, the loan program for a minute, Scott. There is a significant amount of talk in Congress, both, and there's legislation on both the House side as well as the Senate side 
that has been proposed for direct pay. Uh, and, and I'll do the setup here and I'll have you talk about what would happen if that happened. Direct pay would uh, get around the bottleneck of having only 20 big banks that are providing uh, tax equity and would basically, the way this legislation is drafted, would allow what would enable the IRS to basically wire within 100 days, 90 days after the project is placed in service, the 30, uh, a, a wire or equivalent of a payment of that 30% upfront. What would that do to the development of the project? And, and uh, would that de-risk or, or simplify things or not? It's a little bit of an easy one, but uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, if it wasn't clear, um, if it wasn't clear, this whole process could definitely benefit from significant simplification and and the direct pay proposals um, absolutely would do that. Um, it, I mean, if there's anything that's good for the industry, um, you know, like that's just a clear win winner. Um, now, uh, it, you know, it has, it'll have implications on all of the lawyers and service providers and banks that, um, that have been funding this industry. But at the same time, we need more money in it. We need more, we need more capital. Um, we need more investors. And so everything I've heard is that even if we get direct pay, it's not going to, it's not going to negatively impact those in the, you know, those banks and that, that have been making this because we just need more capital going into this space um, in, you know, in, in right now and in the years forward. So the, one of the reasons direct pay is really on the table is, is as you said, Todd, because um, there is a limited number of banks. Well, a lot of those banks didn't make a lot of money last year. They didn't have a lot of taxable income. There's a lot of uncertainty about how much taxable income they're going to have this year although things are looking good, fingers crossed. Um, but that that really did freeze up tax equity last year um, in, in a lot of regards, especially earlier in the year. And so the idea behind direct pay, we actually already saw this in, in the last recession, 2009, um, the government um, instituted something similar to direct pay, was called the 1603 cash grant program under the, under the uh, Recovery Act in 2009. And it literally saved the renewable industry because there were the banks were the banks stopped tax equity investment for quite a long period of time and and only because of the cash grant program did um, renewables continue to grow um, we're hope I think the idea behind people who are promoting direct pay is, is in part just to make sure that doesn't happen that there's no freeze up if the economy starts to hiccup because these banks again remember they want they make an investment this year to take a tax credit this year they don't want to take the tax credit five years later, because that's five years lost, you know, lost time value of money. Um, they need to be able to, they need to be able to have the, the, the tax appetite this year. And that means they need to be making money this year. And the direct pay really takes a lot of that risk off of the table. The other thing that's really great about it, if, if and it depends on how it's drafted and, and what kind of legislation looks like, but the fact is, um, you know, um, it also opens up the ability for sponsors to do this without without all of this complex structuring, right? And, and some proposals say, well, if you don't do this structuring and you do it directly, then you only get 85%. There's other folks out there, you know, that's basically that 15% would be to compensate for all the, the, the you know, the savings um, or to give you a, a discount because of the savings. Another benefit is, as I mentioned before, like opening this up to nonprofits and hospitals and schools. Right now, they basically don't have a way to directly um, kind of own these projects because there are because they're not taxpayers. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of there's a lot of different reasons that uh, I think direct pay could could really uh, really benefit the industry. Great. Well, if, Carrie, if if you're fine, let let me spend ten minutes on uh, the loan program, uh, and then we'll try to bring it together. Does that work? I think Carrie says yes. That works great. I'm saying yes. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you very much. And delighted to be here. And thank you, Carrie, for the opportunity to, to, to speak to this community of folks. It's very exciting for us. Uh, the loan guarantee program um, is, is also one of the ways that uh, the federal government is, is trying to accelerate investment into the offshore wind industry. And there have been some recent developments just in the last uh, month or two uh, that you should all be aware of. And, and once again, 
uh, we're assuming that uh, I'm, I'm going to do a basics here, uh, and there's a lot more detail. But uh, uh, the Department of Energy back in 2005 was authorized to issue loan guarantees and other types of debt instruments in order to promote innovative energy projects. Uh, this program was, was, has been developed and is run by the, the, loan, um, uh, the loan programs office. Sorry, there should be an S on the programs there. Uh, and, and basically the Title 17 program, as it's called, uh, is, is aimed at, at utilizing new technology, energy technologies to, for avoiding greenhouse gases. It's got to be located in the United States and it has to have a reasonable prospect of repayment. These are sort of the, the, the criteria or the main criteria that the loan program office uses for uh, uh, implementing Title 17. In the early days of 2008, 9, and 10 through 11, uh, DOE um, supported 30 different projects, $35 million, uh, but in the last five or six years, they've only done one. Uh, and this is in part due to three factors that I put up here. The processing time has, has really increased and now it's a 12 to 24 month period to know whether you're going to get a loan, a loan guarantee, this is debt by the way, um, uh, from the government. Uh, and the applicants have been required to, to, you know, to, to have to saddle uh, and to pay the DOE back for a bunch of costs. Their attorneys, the DOE's attorney's costs and, and outside engineering experts and all of this, plus application fees and all of this. So, uh, you know, over the last several years, nobody has even, a lot of projects have not even dared to go file because it, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It would take several years. And the ultimate result was very uncertain, especially during the the... Uh, the, the prior administration. Uh, the other thing that had happened over, the, the, over this last five, six, seven years is the reasonable prospect of repayment, and I put that in quotes, uh, has been something that the, the, loan, the LPO, the Loan Programs Office, has been interpreting. And then some people would say has been very conservative. And what that is required is that in order to get uh, this, you need long-term off-date contracts uh, for um, for you know the offtake of the contract uh, for all of the output of the project, which has meant that nobody could could really expect to get out of the program. Hey, Scott, next slide. So uh, President Biden uh, in early Jan well in late January issued an executive order that made it clear that climate and clean energy infrastructure and jobs all sort of interrelated are a major emphasis of, of his uh, administration and the new direction. As you know, uh, U.S. Secretary or Department of Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm uh, uh, who's pictured there, she has also uh, made this a priority and started to work. And, and uh, the, the appointment of Jigger Shaw, who's a, a friend to the renewable industry and uh, uh, came from the early solar industry. Carrie and I have known him for, for years and years. We all have Scott as well. Um, you know, he, he came from uh, a solar industry. He has been working uh, and he co-founded Generate Capital, which is a unique um, um, uh, bank that uh, or investor in early stage technology. So he's been placed in charge of this, and uh, this is this is a remarkable positive development because we know everybody knows that Jigger wants to get this money out. So the program still has forty billion in lending capacity still uh, available to it, and has made a lot of uh, announcements that it fully intends to get out there. In late 2000, uh, well, late last year, in the same, in some legislation, uh, they tried to do, address some of these bottleneck issues through the application, well, application fees and and some of the other problems and administrative uh, expenses. And now uh, the new leadership and Congress are actually also taking a look at this reasonable prospect of repayment. Uh, so, because it's, it's difficult or impossible sometimes to get offtake contracts for all of the various components. So they're trying to stretch, uh, stretch this, this definition of reasonable prospect of repayment uh, to cover more things. So uh, Zim, one more uh, slide, please. 
So the new announcement that I'm sure uh, that, that, that you all heard about on, on March 29th, the Secretaries of Energy, Commerce and Interior set a national goal, uh, Bravo, uh, to deploy 30 gigawatts of uh, offshore wind by 2030. The same day, the loan programs offered issued a fact sheet, and uh, you'll get the slides um, at the end of this, uh, Carrie and, and the team will send these out, and there's links in there. Well, this fact sheet basically outlined how $3 billion uh, of this authority, uh, the LPO authority, uh, has been designated under Title 17 program uh, to go into commercial uh, offshore wind industry. But this is in the stretching part. Uh, they've specifically uh, tried to say that this debt financing will be beyond just the projects out there in the in the uh, uh, the innovative projects that are out in the ocean, but rather they're going to be stretched to foundation manufacturing facilities and dockside facilities, blade manufacturing, and even uh, vessels, uh, Jones Act vessels that uh, can, can be used for the development of these projects. This is early days, but the intent is there. The leadership is there uh, to, to hopefully get us to the point where this $3 billion can be used to, to do more things than just develop projects. It's worth noting that, that this innovative energy program uh, under Title 17 is only um, available to the first three projects of their kind commercialized in the US. So in other words, the fourth offshore wind project will not be eligible uh, for Title 17 debt type of, uh, of um, financing. However, they're trying to stretch this, this debt financing uh, available from the DOE to cover other things where there's other commercialization aspects to them. So uh, we're very excited and we hope that you're excited. Uh, we are going to need to engage with the DOE to make sure that this program uh, is, is usable and is predictable uh, so that it's worthwhile going through. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a, an opportunity. So Scott, I'm going to come back to you with a question. Uh, if we don't have direct pay, is it possible to use both DOE uh, loan, uh, the debt, as well as the 30% tax equity through tax credit? Is that possible? Uh, well, yeah, exactly, and and that would be uh, <laughs> that would be a, a very logical um, a, a logical thing to do. And and the fact is is is. Um, you know, the, the, the whole point of the DOE loan program is to provide lower cost capital, lower cost debt, and um, you would still definitely want to use the tax equity um, uh, as well, and, and you would layer the debt into the capital stack of the, pro of the project. Now, um, Todd, what I think is quite, well, and, and, and then, you know, if, if the DOE loan program was not available because it's not deemed to be innovative anymore, you get beyond that third project or whatever, um, you know, there would, there would be, presumably there would be plenty of other debt. There's lots of capital in the market these days, low cost capital um, from private. So, so that you would still, you would be able to slot a, a private bank in there um, in the place where the DOE took that risk for the first, the first mm -hmm. few projects. Now, Todd, I actually have a question back to you, which is, um, you know, what we're talking about and what you asked me about is project finance. So it's debt going on to the project itself. And what you've described, though, is, is this idea of um, the, using the, the loan program for something for, for you know, manufacturing facilities um, to manufacture equipment um, in the supply chain, vessels, as you said, that sort of stuff. Um, can you, that, that, that's a different kind of, different than project finance, right? That's, uh, that's, that, that, and, and are there, are there examples from kind of the earlier days of the DOE loan program where, sure. where those kinds of things were financed? Well, the, uh, Title 17 actually has three different components in it. Um, and I've only been talking about the innovative energy aspect of it, but there's two others. One is in, uh, uh, for tribal lands. Uh, and obviously offshore wind is not tribal lands, but we can leave that one aside for the minute. Uh, and the other one, well, maybe, who knows? Carrie might have an idea there. Uh, but the other one is uh, advanced vehicles uh, and commercial vehicles. Uh, and actually some of the early EV manufacturing facilities and the like benefited from DOE loans. 
uh, to build these new facilities, to build these cars and, and, and EVs. And there is some conversation of whether you can, you can use these similar types of schemes through DOE to use their, their, both their loan guarantee, which reduces the cost of the debt, as you say, uh, as, as well, to, to promote these types of manufacturing facilities, because the Biden administration is very, very committed to creating good, well-paying jobs on shore. Uh, it, you know, here in the United States, and, and I would imagine. There's another question that came through that relates to that, and it goes to the leadership question that we see. Absolutely, what Scott and I have been discussing, whether it's the tax equity complexity that's created by using the tax code to create energy, or the DOE bureaucratic system of obtaining um, the, the, these benefits for DOE, yes, they're complex. Yes, they're bureaucratic. Yes, they're difficult. But if you can use them, you're basically using somebody else's money, the Department of Energy or, uh, you know, the tax credit, the IRS tax credits to do 30 percent, 50 percent, perhaps even up to 80 percent of the cost of a project. Uh, you know, and, and so these are powerful, powerful tools. And when you can use somebody else's money for free, uh, that's a powerful tool. And sometimes it's going to come, the whole idea is to commercialize technologies that are another, not otherwise easily bankable with other conventional types of loans and, 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 and the like. So yes, it's complex and yes, it's difficult, but uh, this is accelerating. And, and as, as the three of us have seen over the last 20 years, these schemes have accelerated the development uh, and deployment of, of gigawatts and gigawatts of, of renewable energy. Carrie, do you have a question? I do. I, I just want to go back a, a second. Um, and it's a very simple question. It relates to the loan program. So I'm looking at your slide here. Um, so we're, we have specifically included debt financing opportunity for infrastructure, such as, you know, foundation stock side, et cetera. Right. Is that only available through the developer or are you, you know, are you saying there's conversation that the loan program might be available to entities that are, that are doing this work, but not the developer themselves? So, or is it I, going, it might happen. Is it? I think it might happen. I think okay. it might happen. And, and to, to, to answer the question, obviously the developer is not going to be the same entity that manufactures, you know, foundations on site. It's just not, it's going to be an entity that contracts, the developer will contract with these facilities. Similarly, you know, whoever builds the boats, the vessels will not necessarily be the project company that Scott was talking about in the middle of his tax equity uh, scheme. And I use that in the British way of scheme rather than anything devious. But, you know, uh, yes, I think that they're trying to stretch it to do that. This is early days. As I said, this has been out, you know, less than two weeks. But I think that this is the intention of what they're trying to do, because they, they know that even if they, you know, uh, th if you supported the first couple of uh, through D US DOE's innovative loan title 17 program, if you supported the first two or three um, offshore wind projects, it would be done after that. Uh, you know, and, and there would be no new jobs necessarily, or, or a lot fewer jobs, sorry, uh, than, than what you would have if you build an entire industry. So I think that, that, that this, this DOE fact sheet, which is not a rule and, and not really as much information as we would like, I think really is aimed at other aspects of, of what we're talking about, of building the entire industry onshore. And, and if I know anything about Jigger, he's going to figure out a way to, to, to really launch this. Yeah, we have had a few comments, I would say more along the comment line of timing, right? You know, we have these very aggressive goals, both at the state, uh, mandates at the state level, goals at the federal level. Um, and, um, you know, nine years is not a lot of time to get. Well, I, I would be willing to bet that of the 3 billion and the 30 or the 40 billion, uh, I would be wet, bet, willing to bet that DOE is going to be uh, under the new leadership, going to be trying to get most of that money out the door and at least committed uh, within the next three years. Sure, sure. We have um, about, well, we're, I, I wasn't quite sure how long we'd be on today. So we have about five minutes at the top of the hour and I, I don't want to 
um, keep you gentlemen too long so you can actually start your day in, on the West Coast, <laughs> the real day. Um, but we do have one um, question that might be helpful for people. Um, there was an ask if we could go back to the slide that shows, I think Scott's flowchart, which is that complex um, picture. Flip. Um, and uh, it, there's not quite a question here, but um, I, I think it is useful for people that are trying to get their heads around how this, how this as you said, scheme works. Um, this particular scheme anyway. Um, in this instance, Mark, is or Scott, excuse me, it says the tax investor 60% equity and the developer is 40. Um, I think maybe the, the question there is, do those percentages change a lot or is that typically what you see? You know, what's the yeah. kind of- So, so I, think, I think for offshore wind, actually tax equity is probably gonna be less, significantly less than 60. So this is a, this is a diagram that I, that I pulled um, actually from a solar um, a solar example, um, and so I think you know it, it really really the number that you're able to get to there is going to depend on a lot of factors and modeling factors, and I I think my 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 sense is for the offshore wind projects um, ITC projects you're you're probably going to end up somewhere much less than sixty percent. Um, of the capital stack coming from tax equity, may, you know, maybe 30 or something like that. But again, it's, it's typically a modeling exercise to, to get as, you know, as much, as much as you can, um, um, but, but then not to give the tax equity investor much of the cash. You're trying to get them all the tax benefits that are available and, and, um, and, and usually a fairly limited amount of the cash. So um, if, if the question was around is 60% typical for offshore wind is probably the answer is no. Um, it's probably a little high for, for this industry. Is hey, Scott, though, there's a follow-up question. The idea of tax equity is that, correct me if I'm wrong and expand, but the idea is that the, the entity that wants the tax credits has to be in there for five years, which is the tax recapture period. It's the time during which they're exposed to this IRS risk and whatnot. Um, as soon as they've received their benefits, which they receive largely in the first year, and then they ride along for five years, the, the flip, explain the flip, because the flip is, I think, very important to what the developer and the sponsor want in the long run. Can you just explain what happens sort of at the flip point? Yeah, the, the word flip is a flip in the economics after um, that period of time, which is which you described the five year period of time, which is the recapture period. And it's the period of time that the tax equity investor needs to stay invested in the project in order to in order to keep those tax credits that it took on day one. Um, they need to stay in for five years. Otherwise, the tax credits get recaptured and pulled back. Um, so the way that this the whole idea of the flip is that the economics basically go to mostly to the tax equity investor during that five year period. And then it's just built into the, into the structure that the economics flip such that they go to, um, go to the developer or sponsor after the five year period. What that means is the equity interest that the, that the tax equity investor holds after the flip is a small economic interest, relatively speaking. And it's like actually very relatively easy to buy it out. And that's the whole idea is that the, the developer is incentivized because of that low price to just get the tax equity out of the picture at that point, buy them out for a relatively low price. And that, that what we're trying to do is, is all these, again, machinations to make this look like debt. Because if this were just debt, it'd be easy. You just pay it off after five years. And, uh, um, but you can't structure it as debt because then you wouldn't be eligible for the tax uh, benefits. Right. So the, the punchline there is that that after the flip, that, that you don't have to deal with the tax equity investor telling you what to do and all of that. And the sponsor or the developer ends up owning a much greater sh uh, share of the benefit and control of the project. Exactly, control as well, that's a good point. Interesting, thank you. That was really actually helpful. I'm glad we went back, um, back, back to that slide, um, really great. So um, it is top of the hour uh, and, um, I know um, you, like I said, probably want to get another cup of coffee. Um, 
I first, um, thank you both so much. This is like a fascinating, really, really helpful, I think, to our audience, which includes a lot of supply chain folks um, on both aspects, understanding developers and how they're working, how they might work with the ITC and the PTC, and then the loan program as, gee, you know, might this be more applicable even to a broader set of suppliers um, beyond the developers? Um, and there's a lot more to come on that. So I actually see us maybe doing another one of these once we get some more. Um, sure. Uh, Carrie, more if, Carrie yeah. if I could do a little advertisement for the LPO, I, I think that, that if you look and they've got a wealth of information on their website uh, through the fact sheet and the like, but they really, really, really want interest fr from the people who are are potentially looking at the program, and they're very open. This is not a bureaucratic system that you that you simply just file a piece of paper and hope for the best. They actually want to engage with people like this organ that were members of this organization to talk about what they're trying to do and to try to help to figure out how they can get you into a program that actually works. They're very interested and they're very bright, committed people. Uh, they live in a political world, uh, but they are trying to do the right thing. So, you know, I would encourage everybody here to engage uh, with the DOE LPO. That's great. Okay, that, that's awesome. Thank you. That's really good advice. I appreciate it. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave everyone with saying, first, we're going to... Um, I'm just gonna go back a second. Todd mentioned at the very start, or Scott, I guess it was you, Todd, excuse me, um, mentioned the announcement that was made on March 29th by the DOE and all that came with that, um, which included the announcement of our awards. So we're gonna put the link in, um, I think in the chat here, just to the awards um, section right now. If people wanna stick around for one second, that'll be there. Then you can see all the awards that we made to some of these innovative projects that are helping to get offshore wind built. Um, so that's great. Um, and then finally, um, thank you both very much. Really, really helpful. Um, reminder to everyone that listened in today, uh, the slides and the um, recording will be made available sometime next week. Um, and again, thank you both. Great, thank Thanks, you. Mary. Okay, have a good day. Bye.